Hello, I'm Stefano Mazzardo and I'm Giuseppe Giannotti and we are two members of the student committee for Fence Forum in 2040 and we are pleased to introduce you the video interview of Fence Forum speakers. Hello, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you Dr. Patrick Verstrecken, neuroscientist from Leuven. His research is focused on how does the nervous system transmit electrical pulses between neurons and how is this process affect in neuronal disease. So, Dr. Verstecken, please introduce yourself and tell us about your professional background. Well, so my name is uh, Patrick Verstrecken and I am a Belgian citizen and um, I studied bioengineering in, at the University of Brussels. Um, in 98, I graduated there and I moved to the US to perform a PhD. Um, my PhD was in uh, developmental biology and my advisor was uh, Hugo Bellum. And it was my first encounter with fruit flies where um, I performed large scale screens and uh, got acquainted with all the technology that is available to fruit fly researchers. Um, and I also did a little bit of reverse genetics where I studied the function of very specific genes, um, not that much in developmental biology admittedly, but much more in synaptic function. Um, and so from there, everything actually started rolling because uh, synaptic dysfunction tends to be an early feature in neurodegenerative disease as well. And so I kind of um, got in contact with neurodegenerative disease already that early on in, in my career. Um, I stayed on to do a postdoc in the same lab, which is a little bit unconventional. But the reason that I decided to do so was that I had performed these big screens um, where we screened literally close to 500,000 different Newtons and I was like, eh, if I leave now, all that work was probably not in vain, but somewhat in vain to myself. And so I couldn't really do that to me and to all those lonely nights that I, well, lonely, we weren't, re I wasn't really lonely, but all those nights that I spent in the fly room, pushing flies and uh, listening to music as well, I guess. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I needed to capitalize on all that work. Um, rolled into more synaptic dysfunction, but also mitochondrial dysfunction and the connection between these two and how mitochondria would be active at synapses to maintain synaptic release. Um, and my postdoc largely revolved around that question. Um, published the papers that uh, I was working on and then started looking for jobs. Um, but at the same time, I also applied for um, grants that would allow me to return to Europe. Um, and so one of those grants uh, was granted to me, which allowed me to set up uh, with my feet running, I guess. Um, so I, I, I had a, a good amount of uh, cash at my disposal to really get the lab uh, up and running quite quickly. And so I joined the VIB Center for Biology of Disease and the University of Leuven um, now about seven and a half years ago. And um, yeah, started studying questions in relation to synaptic transmission and neurodegenerative disease, which were projects that um, I got started working on as a postdoc and have continued to do so um, as an independent group leader as well. Please give us a preview of your lecture at the Fence Forum 2014. So the work that I'll be discussing revolves around Parkinson's disease, which um, I'm sure you know is a very, very common neurodegenerative disorder. Um, at the age of 65, more than 1% of the population is, is suffering from this disease, above 82%, which means that any audience you're looking at, there are always a couple of people that will actually be getting this disease. It's super common. It's, it's after Alzheimer's disease, the most common uh, neurodegenerative disease and the most common movement disorder um, that exists. So the annoying thing, I guess, is that there is no real cure for this disease. Um, and even symptom symptomatic treatments are suboptimal. Um, most, of, most of the symptomatic treatments revolve around uh, re-establishing dopaminergic tonus, 
but after a while this wears off and um, is also not really sufficient. In addition to that, there are numerous um, defects that are associated with the disease that are not the result um, directly then of uh, dopaminergic neuron dysfunction. And so I think a more systemic or systematic approach to identify um, a cure for this uh, delibitating disease is, is absolutely needed. The approach that we have been taking is again starting from fruit flies to perform large scale screens to identify novel components that would suppress the defects associated with the genetic forms of this disorder. Now, of course, you could argue, well, these are fruit flies and obviously not humans, but doing a screen in humans is not that trivial, obviously, <laughs> let be impossible. Yeah. So um, the reason we are using fruit flies is that the mechanisms of this disease are to a good extent conserved. You can actually take, for example, a pink one mutant fruit fly and bring back a wild type human pink one gene and fully, fully rescue the defects in this fruit fly, indicating that the function of this human pink one gene can recapitulate whatever was defective in the fruit fly, suggesting evolutionary conservation of the mechanisms surrounding this disease. And so based on that fact, we uh, performed a large scale screen to identify these components that would suppress um, the defects associated with this one genetic form of Parkinson's disease, which is the pink one deficiency, but we're also looking at other um, genetic forms of the disease, and identified um, a whole number of components, but one of which I will discuss in more detail, which is a gene that is involved in the production of vitamin K2. And vitamin K2 is a lipid-soluble vitamin that had not been linked to Parkinson's disease before and is most well known for its role in blood coagulation in humans. It's involved in the complement cascade. Um, and in doing in, with, in, in this complement cascade, what it is actually doing is it is accepting electrons. It is going to an oxido reduction cycle as well. Actually, the most common source of vitamin K2 in our bodies is the bacterial population in your gut. And also there, vitamin K2 is an electron transfer molecule. So we thought, well, if vitamin K2 can transport electrons, in bacteria and also in our bodies, maybe it can also do so in mitochondria. And as such, it could be a molecule that is involved in making the electron transport chain more efficient and as such produce more ATP. So this was a hypothesis, of course, at the time. And we performed a bunch of uh, biochemical experiments as well as genetic experiments to tease out whether this is actually um, going on in fly mitochondria and human mitochondria as well. And our hypothesis turned out to be true, at least, I mean, to a good extent, where we were able to show that vitamin K2 serves as a novel electron carrier molecule in our mitochondria as well. And that if you give vitamin K2 to fruit flies, but more recently also to patients, that you can improve the dysfunctionality of the mitochondria and as such promote the well-being of the cells that are suffering from the uh, deficiency at the level of the pink one mutation. Now, you could argue, well, pink one is a very rare, I mean, mutations in pink one is a very rare event, right? Parkin the genetic forms of Parkinson's disease account to about 10% of all the cases of Parkinson's disease and the pink one mutation accounts for 1%. So you could argue, well, okay, fine. So you found, you know, something that alleviates this super rare event in the world, but we think that it actually might be something more common as well, because if you um, look at the number of studies that are fairly old these days, then you find that complex one deficiency, mitochondrial deficiency, is something that occurs also um, in the sporadic cases of Parkinson's disease and not just in the genetic cases of the disease. And in addition to that, there's been uh, some anecdotal evidence that um, uh, drug abusers were, the drugs were, um, contaminated with MPTP, which is a complex one um, a toxin that also blocks mitochondrial function, that these people also uh, got signs that looked like Parkinson's disease. And actually these days, MPTP is one of the more commonly used drugs to model uh, sporadic forms of Parkinson's disease as well. So we think that our studies at the level of the genetic forms of Parkinson's disease in fruit flies, but more recently also in IPS cells or differentiated neurons from humans, 
um, may be relevant to the to the sporadic cases of the disease as well. Which are the advantages of the use of the fly fruits model? The advantages of using the fly is essentially that um, you can do a, you. You can combine on the one end um, large-scale genetic screens with very uh, functional studies or very in-depth functional studies. So it's fairly straightforward to generate mutations in fruit flies. Um, there are no ethical concerns in using fruit flies, so you can use large numbers um, and you can go into exquisite detail in studying single cells from fly to fly. So essentially what you can do is you can um, within one single fly, um, identify one specific cell and study its phenotype. And then you can go to the next fly and identify exactly the same cell again and study, this, study its phenotype and so on and so forth. You can do this with hundreds and hundreds of flies, which is next to impossible in most other organisms. So you have a very high technical reproducibility in that sense. And secondly, um, to model neurodegenerative disease, um, they are, in my view, a prime system as well because um, in many cases you can take the human gene, put it back in the fruit fly and rescue the mutant fruit fly using the human gene. As I just told you, for pink one this is the case, but this is true for many other diseases as well. So, um, which tells you that the, fun that, that, that the, the effects that you're uh, detecting in a fruit fly are most likely evolutionary conserved. But I think that um, it's wise to take the findings that you make with a fruit fly and go test whether the basic biology that you discovered using your fruit fly model is holding true at the level of um, a human neuron as well. And so these days with, uh, with, with the technology surrounding iPS cells and ESL differentiation, uh, this is fairly feasible and we are uh, quite routinely doing this as well. Um, allowing us to very quickly discover novel biology and then go test whether this novel biology is holding true at the level of human neurons as well. In your opinion, in the last 10 years, which is the most important finding for the comprehension of Parkinson's disease? Oh, I think um, twofold. Um, on the one hand, I think the discovery that mitochondrial dysfunction is linked to Parkinson's disease um, has been a major breakthrough and probably came from the discovery of the genes that are uh, causing Parkinson's disease, at least to a very good extent. As I told you, the sporadic cases have been linked to mitochondrial dysfunction as well. But I think these findings became definitely more believable when people identified the Parkin and the PINK1 mutations and the DJ1 mutations that are, well, some of them are mitochondrial proteins. And so uh, connecting mitochondrial dysfunction much more firmly to Parkinson's disease. Um, another important finding in my view is that many of these mutations or many of the conditions that are causing Parkinson's disease are affecting autophagy as well. Uh, thereby connecting defects at the level of autophagy to Parkinson's disease as well. But I think the, the latter needs to be worked out in more detail than, uh, than the former um, being the, the defects at the level of mitochondrial dysfunction. Why should the student and the young neuroscientist attend the Defense Forum 2014? Well, I can't really tell you specifically for the fans 2014, given that the meeting hasn't happened yet. So afterwards, I'll be able to tell you how what a fantastic meeting this has been. But in my view, I think students and, and postdocs and, and any researcher should be attending meetings, mostly in my view, to go and meet other scientists and to exchange ideas, uh, to meet your peers, to... Um, to go visit posters and uh, to try and, and ask as many questions as you can during the oral presentations as to um, engage in a discussion uh, with each other. And in my view, and I tell everybody in the lab, going to a meeting is more than just going to sit through all the different talks. I think it's much more important to hit the bar afterwards and go talk to your colleagues than to sit through all the through all the talks. Honestly, everything that you're hearing there probably will be published or is already published, you know, half a year before within the half year coming after the meeting. So, I mean, 
listening to the talks is important. That, that's why you're going to the meeting. I'm not saying to skip all the talks, but I think it's much more important to go talk to people and to, to discuss uh, with the scientists, your colleague postdocs, your colleague students, and uh, maybe your future mentors. What are you most looking forward at the forum? Uh, yeah, meet, meet, meet all of you guys and uh, exchange and discuss uh, our research and your research. Um, I think that is what is exciting about it. Learn, learn new things and, and learn new techniques or uh, learn about new insights in the field. Um, what is up in the field of Parkinson's disease? Uh, what is up in the field of neurodegenerative disease? Um, what new technology is being developed in the world of fruit flies or in the world of IPS and ESL differentiation? I mean, yeah, I think that's that's what it in the end will come down to. And that's what I'm always looking forward to. I, I think you need to know that FENS as the, the annual neuroscience meeting are very large, very broad scoped meetings. And I think you need to know that before you attend these meetings um, as to be aware of the broadness of uh, what is coming at you. And um, I think if you know that and you are open to that, then this can be a very, very uh, insightful experience. Do you want to leave a message for a younger neuroscientist? I think follow your guts, you know, make sure that you develop a fantastic gut feeling and um, follow where your heart is taking you. Do, do, do things that you really like to do and um, think about what you're doing regularly and uh, make sure that you're studying something that um, makes a difference. Okay. This was the last question. Thanks, Dr. Vestrecken, for your kind participation. And for everyone, don't miss his lecture and see you at the forum. Bye-bye.